Hi, my name is Jamie Mafio, and we're here today. We're about to conduct a Skype interview with Isabel Kirshner, who is a criminal defense attorney in New York, and we're going to discuss the Boston Marathon trial. We should start by asking you to tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Isabel Kirshner. I'm a criminal defense lawyer in New York City. I'm a partner in the firm of Clayman and Rosenberg. And uh, Mr. Clayman is a native of Boston, of Quincy, Mass. So he, he has, some of our firm has a heart there. Um, mm -hmm. I, for many years, was on the CJA panel in New York City, which is the court-appointed panel for indigent clients in federal courts. And I was also on what we called the death penalty panel. So um, fortunately, I never had to defend somebody who was actually charged, was, was going to be put to death. Mm -hmm. But in order to be on the death penalty panel, you have to be qualified. Um, the law says that you have to, if a person is charged with a crime that is, and this is in federal courts we're talking about, that if a person is charged with a crime that is eligible for punishment by death, they're entitled to at least one learned counsel, and that's somebody who's qualified to represent somebody in a death penalty case, and another lawyer. Um, and it's actually a very long process. It probably, the, the pretrial process in this case probably didn't take that long because I don't think there was much question as to what the government's intentions were from the beginning. Right. But in most cases, the first thing that a lawyer does who's representing somebody who's charged with um, a death penalty eligible crime is they spend a lot of time trying to convince the government not to seek the death penalty. Um, and they do that for the obvious reason is that you don't want your client to pay, face that penalty. But the sort of more subtle reason is that if the government certifies the case for death, and this can take years, this process, this preliminary process, um, you, you actually submit a very uh, lengthy detailed report to the government, sort of with the view that let's assume that the guy did it, mm -hmm. but now let's talk about whether this is the appropriate case for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. um, that goes down to the Department of Justice. They actually have something called a death committee in the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And lawyers, as myself, and I've done it a number of occasions, mm -hmm. go down and you make your pre an oral presentation to the, that group of people um, in an effort to convince them that this is not the appropriate case to seek death penalty. Um, some of the people on that committee are people who are on the committee all the time. Some of them are sort of rotating members who are in various jurisdictions around the country. So when you go and you make your presentation, um, it's one of the most chilling things you can imagine because nobody gives you any feedback. They rarely ask you any questions. You just go and you make a presentation and say thank you, and they say thank you. And then if you're lucky, you get a one-page fax that says, we have determined not to seek the death penalty. But oh, wow. the, one of the sort of practical effects of seeking the death penalty is not only your client is facing the death penalty, is that you, you now get a jury that has been wadiered or has been questioned and selected mm -hmm. on the basis of the fact that they're willing to impose the death penalty um, should it come to that. And so obviously sort of the whole... Uh, view of the jury is, is a different view of a jury that you would want normally. They're not going to be left-wing liberal people who, who are likely to even acquit your client. Right. Uh, right. And so when you represent somebody in a case that has the death penalty as a possible, um, as a possible punishment, from the, the defense attorney's point of view, it's almost counterintuitive because what, what you really want to do, it, your job is to save this person's life. Um, the likelihood is that it's a very serious crime. The likelihood is that there's significant evidence against your client. The likelihood is that your client's going to get convicted. And so you really sort of put aside the, your efforts in exonerating them from the underlying crime. I mean, unless it's a triable case where that's a possibility. But your real efforts are geared towards how do I save this person's life? Um, so some of the tactical decisions that are made during the trial are really made with a view towards what's going to happen in the penalty phase after this person is convicted. Right. And so while it may look like a, you know, a forceful defense is not launched during the trial phase, that's probably because there's a strategic decision to sort of save your punches for, or save, you know, save your ammo for, for the death penalty phase. Right. In terms of when there is a case where somebody's committed these heinous crimes and putting that person on the stand because they're able to use the witness 
to show that he does have remorse. But in terms of that decision, whether or not to actually put Sarnaev on the stand, do you think, what are some other factors that sort of went into that, in your opinion? Well, once you put your client in the, on the witness stand, mm -hmm. um, your client is subject to cross-examination. Um, and a, an effective lawyer can bring out all sorts of things about your client that you may not right. want before the jury, whether they're remorseful or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, in any trial, it's very rare that defendants testify because, you, one, you're obviously mm -hmm. you're not under any obligation to do so, and the jury will be told that. But there's a whole host of things that come out um, that may or may not be relevant. And it's not likely to be something, I mean, what's his answer going to be? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I certainly could understand in a situation like this, he's a good-looking young man. You probably are better off having the jury sit there and wonder what he's going to say mm -hmm. than having him say what he's going to say. Right. Trials are very fluid events, and things happen. And, and you know, in this case, you had obviously a very um, notorious case that brought out enormous emotions not only in Boston, but across the country. Um, and there are the things that happen in the courtroom and things that happen outside the courtroom. And in spite of the judge's strongest you know, instructions to the jury about that they're not to read anything or come to any facts, mm -hmm. there's a lot of information out there that jurors are getting. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this case, one of, one of the things that happened is that the parents of the little boy that were killed basically came out in the middle of the mm -hmm. trial and said, we don't want the death penalty here. Uh, I'm sure that in spite of the judge's instructions, the jury knows about that. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be, as in any trial, regardless of what whether the death penalty is in play or not, you have to be a little light on your feet and be able to adjust to things that occur. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, and so I think in this case, the emotions are running so very, very high um, I, it, you know, he's a very fortunate young man that he's being represented by an extraordinarily skilled death penalty uh, advocate. Mm -hmm. um, Judy Clark is, just travels around the country, and this is kind of what she does. Um, she's incredibly experienced and incredibly skilled, and, and, and I think you mentioned that you were there to see her summation today, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that was really pretty extraordinary to see. Yeah. So um, I'm sure that during the course of the trial, as evidence came out, different decisions were made as to how they were going to employ that or seek to deflect that during the death penalty phase. I guess during like uh, jury selection process in particular, there was a lot of focus on um, the defense trying to change the location of the trial. Um, do you think like ultimately that, I mean, I mean, that's such a big what if, but I guess changing that location, like trying so many times to get that change well, look, I, I think they had to do that. It, yeah. would have been, it would have been malpractice not to have done that. I'm not sure that, you know, it, it, in New York, uh, there was a famous case many, many years ago where there was a public corruption case, and, and they moved the case up to New Haven, Pencil, New Haven Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was still a conviction. Or, um, you know, I think this is a case that there was so much notoriety about that I'm not sure where you would have moved it. But certainly, I think the, the concern was that there were people on this jury who, if not directly, but certainly indirectly, were affected by the event, and that you know the only chance you may have had is somebody was living in a cave for the last couple of years and, and didn't hear about it. Right. That there was no chance of that occurring in Boston. So, you know, I, I guess they, they, I, I would have done the same thing. I'm not sure that it matters. One at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. There, I guess, obviously, there was that very, like, it became a very infamous photo of the defendant, like, having, uh, putting up his middle finger to the camera. And do you think that sort of backfired on the prosecution? I think, it, I, I don't know whether it backfired or not, but I think it was a stupid, I mean, you know, I think any human being who's locked in a cage for, you know, as long as he's been, yeah. um, knowing that he's under scrutiny at all times, is likely to act out. Right. I, you know, I, I'm not sure, I'm just not so sure how powerful piece of evidence it is. That's what you got as your best argument. Yeah. I would think there are a whole lot of better arguments to be made than that. Yeah, and it definitely gave the defense an opportunity because I know, especially in the closing statement, uh, Judy Clark mentioned how he's been there for like two years and this is like one tiny snapshot of what he's done. Yeah. Um, so if I, any... just, I, I, I don't think anyone's going to put him to death for giving him a finger to the camera. Right. I, I just... just... <laughs> yeah. you know, there's plenty of other reasons that they have that they can do that. That's that's not going to do it. 
Right. I think it diminishes the strength of their case. I, I just think it's stupid. I, I, I don't know why they bother with it. I mean, look, if this is a case where you can't be righteously indignant and call for, you know, justice for these, you know, the hundreds of maimed and the, and the three dead people, I, I don't know what else you could ask for. The fact that the guy gave somebody the finger is really sort of not the most important part of this case. What do you think about uh, the nun, Sister Prajan, um, the testimony that she gave in terms of how she's met with him and he's expressed his sorrow? Do you think that will have a big impact? Or I th Well, look, I mean, I, I don't know what the makeup of the jury is. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you have some very religious Catholic people who are going to ascribe a great deal of value to what a nun says to them. Mm -hmm. It seems to me it's a fairly, if I'm the government, it's a fairly easy cross-examination. I mean, you know, she doesn't believe that anybody should be, ever be executed for whatever they do. Mm. And, you know, she may believe that he's remorseful. She may believe what she said. But, you know, this is not an objective observer of things. She's there as an advocate. She, you know, there was a movie made about it, for God's sake. So mm. I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about the, you know, the qualitative value of that evidence, quite frankly. It just right. didn't strike me. But maybe you have a couple of very... Again, I don't know what the jury looks like, and, and maybe the maybe the I'm assuming that the lawyers made an informed decision about putting her on. Do you believe this trial will set a good or bad precedent for future trials? Well, I I, I am not a proponent of the death penalty. I, I understand that this is a you know I certainly can put this in the category of horrible cases mm -hmm. where somebody did a horrible thing. I, I, I am not a proponent of the death penalty. Um, I, I suppose that if they impose the death penalty, um, it's going to have it's going to have enormous consequences. And if they don't, it's going to have enormous consequences. Or I, I actually think if they don't, it's going to have much fewer consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it has the potential to to have big consequences. And and I think one of the stronger arguments that the defense can make is what he wants is to be a martyr. Don't let him be a martyr. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think um, he certainly has been provided with very able counsel. There's been a huge amount of resources invested in this case. Nobody can say that he was railroaded and, you know, didn't get a fair trial. Um, but I certainly think that if he is executed, it's going to have consequences. And it's going to take a long time for it to happen. If you could ask a juror any question, what would it be? I think I'd ask whether or not they'd be the ones who are willing to, you know, throw the switch. Would they be personally able to take responsibility for a person's life? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, you know, it's that that's really what's happening here. You, you can only remove yourself so far from what the imposition of the ultimate penalty is, and, and I think that's an important thing to know. Was this case, do you think, harder for the prosecution or the defense? It appeared to me, and I, I didn't follow it every day, that there was an overwhelming amount of evidence in this case. I don't think, I don't think certainly with respect to the guilt phase, there was a, a lot of heavy lifting here. Um, I, you know, I think it's an interesting case for, for the, uh, on the penalty phase. Um, as I said, you know, emotions are running very high in this case. I think there's going to be um, a lot of good arguments that can be made on either side. I don't know what's going to happen in the penalty phase in this case. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like they're trying this case in Alabama. It's, it's, Boston's pretty, in spite of, you know, in spite of who baseball teams they root for, it's a pretty liberal city, um, pretty liberal place. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 look, as I said, part of the problem here is once you certify a case for death, people are, who are on the jury are on the jury because they're willing to impose the death penalty. So obviously these people have said they're willing to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I don't. I'm not sure that it's it's that easy of a case. I think it's a very difficult decision. I think it should be difficult. And it should be a difficult decision. Thank you so so much. Really, I really appreciate it. On behalf of Isabel Kirshner, this is Jamie Mafio for Arlington Public News.